folks, and welcome or welcome back to NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima, I'm again. And this podcast was brought to you, among others, by Emil Gorgis, a Tokyo real estate agent who specializes in serving international or mixed nationality families looking for the perfect family home. So Emil's an Australian. He's been living here in Japan for the past two decades, eight years of which he's been actively buying, selling, and managing real estate properties in the city on behalf of his own family and a great many happy clients. And he also acts as a mortgage broker on behalf of his clients. So his company has a dedicated loan officer in many of the Japanese mega banks. And if you're a regular listener, you probably already know him from our JREP, the Japan Real Estate Experts panel sessions. So you're probably already aware that the man is an absolute fountain of wisdom on all things related to real estate in Japan, and in particular to family homes, the greater Tokyo metropolitan area and mortgages. And most importantly, he's incredibly generous with his time and advice, which he's more than happy to provide at no cost or commitment to anyone asking. So if you've been thinking about buying your home in Tokyo, but you've been sitting on the fence for a while, or if you just want to have a chat in English with a real expert, drop him a line on emil.gorgis, that's E-M-I-L dot G-O-R-G double E S Emil dot Gorgis at Tokyo Realty dot JP. Hit him up today and start exploring your options. Okay, so in this episode, we speak to a USA citizen who's been living in Japan for quite a long time, more specifically in Kumamoto, and he already has some investment properties that he's purchased in the city. He wanted to ask our opinion about potentially recycling these smaller, older properties into a larger, newer one. He's also been able to purchase using investment loans, even without having permanent residency, which can be quite rare in Japan. So we also pick his brain a bit, mainly about building and nurturing relationships with Japanese banks. And he then in turn picks my brain about the advantages and disadvantages of different types of investment. So individual units versus buildings, the difference between the local market in Kumamoto versus Fukuoka, which is the nearest largest metropolitan center to Kumamoto and some other attractive locations around Japan. And we also talk a bit about purchasing under a company name or as an individual. And now this is a conversation that we've had here many times before, but in his case, he's already got a couple of companies set up in Japan. So the conversation is slightly different to the ones we normally have with people who are wondering if they should set up a company strictly for the purpose of property investment. We also talk about our services at NTI, our fees, the difference between hiring us as consultants versus a full purchase facilitation. And then we also touch lightly on the topic of long-term leases, monthly rentals, and full short-term state properties such as Minpaku or Airbnb. So really good, diverse conversation there. Plenty of info. Hope you enjoy it. And I'll see you again on the other side. Okay. Cool. So you're here in Japan and you already have properties and you're looking to what, roll them over? Or? Yeah. Um, so I've been in Japan for about 10 years. Um, uh, I bought my first kind of mansion type property six, five or six years ago. Um, I've got six of them now. Um, they're kind of spread out. Um, I will likely be leaving. Um this August or July, I'm not super sure when. Um, so I'm thinking about, yeah, maybe rolling them over to a larger property or doing something else with them. I'm not sure. Okay. And did you purchase those um, strictly as investment properties via normal Japanese real estate brokerages or? Yes. Okay. Um, so I, I guess my first question is, what's the question? So do, do you want to sell them and then use those funds to buy something else, which I'm guessing you'd probably do the same way or? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm really wondering what's, what's the best thing to do. Um, should I look at just holding on to the properties I have now, even though I'll be gone or um, cause I was listening to your podcast recently where you were talking about uh, the benefits of having, you know, uh, one, a pato versus a bunch of different little mansions, right? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if that's going to be easier to manage uh, while I'm gone. Um, would it be better to sell off these small properties and then use that 
to put a down payment on a larger property, you know, uh, I'm kind of just thinking about my options, I guess. Okay, so um, a few, few, few things to unpack there. First thing is, um, how are they performing and how old are they? Are they properties that you would basically want to hold on for longer to if you could? Or have you already been considering reselling them for whatever reason? Or um, I mean, they're all, they're all performing fine. Um, uh, three, let me think about this. Uh, I have no loans on four of them. Um, so they're all cash flowing 40 or 50,000 yen a month. Yep. And then another two, uh, I have loans on, um, I think there's another two or three loans, uh, sorry, two or three years left on those loans. So two or three years, they'll be paid off. Um, there's nothing particularly wrong with them. Um, the buildings are say about 30 years old. So not super new, but also, uh, quite central in Komoto. So, uh, desirable so areas. Komoto, or, right? Yeah, they're, they're all kind of in the downtown here uh, in Kumoto. Um, okay, and then so, are they all managed by the same property manager? Um, yes, basically. Um, two of them I manage directly um, because actually my company staff is living there now. Okay. So um, we just withdraw the rent from their paychecks and don't really need a management company but in the future after i leave then we'll we'll ask the same property manager to come in and step in there just to make sure everything goes smoothly with the okay. repairs and stuff so if, if it's going to be the same company managing the same i'm assuming the similar number of doors so you might you know roll over those six units into a building with six units kind of thing right mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. Hassle-wise, I don't think your management would increase or decrease whichever way you go, right? Mm -hmm. um, when you own the building, there's a few more things to think about in the sense that um, you also need to take care of the structural maintenance, whereas now you're just taking care of the interior. Mm -hmm. um, but depending on the age of the building, that might not be much. Like the buildings that we manage, usually there are kind of decisions to be made maybe twice a year kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And once mm -hmm. every 10, 15 years, there's maybe a bigger innovation to consider. Um, mm -hmm. Whether or not your existing property management company can also handle buildings, regardless of that, it's still going to be a single company handling it, right? So if it's a small yeah. building, it's going to be one company handling um, both what the, the guys are doing for you now, both the uh, tenant management, but also that same company would also know how to handle the building itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So management hassle-wise, I don't think there's going to be a huge difference. Um, okay. Advantages that I can see would, A, you might be able to get something that's a little bit newer, which is always mm. a good thing. Uh, also, if and when land gains in value, you will stand to gain more because the um, just the land parcel is bigger. But in Kumamoto, that's probably not a huge consideration. Capital I really know. Yeah, not really on the cards there. <laughs> Um, yeah. Did you maybe think to switch to a different location as well? Or are you happy with them? Being yeah, of, of course, Fukuoka is uh, kind of the obvious place. Um, everywhere else in Kyushu, always looking to Fukuoka. If I'm not going to be local anymore, it doesn't really matter where the properties are. But yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Fukuoka is, uh, I don't understand the Fukuoka retail market uh, very well, but I understand it much better than you know Osaka or Tokyo for example yep. um, so uh, my my banker told me that you know if you want to buy something in the like 60 to 80 million range then I'm going to want you to put you know 15 to 20 million cash for a down payment that's so, cool yeah yeah so yeah. what I was thinking was I, I could sell what I have now probably get in the 15 to 20 million range and then roll that into that kind of larger property. And then your, doing the banker, that, it could does be your banker know that you're leaving the country, by the way? Yes. And they're okay giving you a loan even though you're not going to be a resident anymore? Yes. Okay. Um, that, that's, that's rare. Okay. That's great. Uh, yeah. Um, strange bank. Yeah. Uh, Kumoto Bank. It's managed by Fukuoka Bank now. but um, Okay. Yeah, I don't have permanent residence either. Um, so that's another thing that uh, sometimes causes issues. And they with, gave you an investment loan? Uh, yeah, actually, 
in my third year, I think I got my first in investment loan and I've just been working with uh, Kumoto Bank the whole time. So uh, just been kind of maintaining that relationship and it's worked well. Well, first off, put all of our discussion aside and please put me in touch with your banker. I need to talk to this dude. <laughs> That would be, uh, yeah, well, we've got, we've got so many customers who would be very happy if they, I mean, they doubled their purchases overnight if they could get loans not being residents. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's um, yeah, um, the, ma the main thing is I can only get investment loans. I, I can't touch any other loan products. Like I can't get a car loan. I can't get a house loan. I can't get a reform loan, but I can get a, a business loan. Yep. Oh, so those so, were not those were not property mortgages. They were business loans. Um, not m mortgages. Well, I mean, they were. They had the property as tampo, but they like within the bank system, they're done as uh, business loans. Jigyo jigyo loans, right? Yep, so yep, business yep. loans. Yeah. So um, they they do have um, the property as collateral, but not as some sort of property or home loan or any of that. So they're pretty creative, open-minded kind of bankers. That's rare in Japan. Yeah, well, uh, the first one I had to buy with like 80% cash down. Yeah. And I, I came to the bank and said, I want to start a relationship with your bank because I have a company separately. I wanted to be able to take out loans for my company. I said, I want to start a relationship. I've got this property I'm looking to buy. I can pay for it with cash, but why don't you guys give me a loan for a small percentage just so that we can build a relationship? And that, that's kind of what happened. So since then, it, it's been easier to kind of work with them. That's fantastic. Well, look, from a, from a property, strictly a property perspective, we always do recommend to people who can afford to, to go for the small building just for the fact that it gives them more flexibility and creative mm -hmm. freedom down the track, right? Like if you suddenly want to lease properties out by the month, if the tourists come back or even Airbnb, if you get the license, um, mm -hmm. that's something that you're not going to be able to do with the individual units. Mm -hmm. But it also requires more capital reserves because if and when something goes on the structure, it's all on you. There's no kumiai, there's no um, owner union or, or building management company that collects monthly for that. Mm -hmm. So you need to have the financial discipline to put funds aside every month or to make sure that you've got enough reserves from other sources so that if and when something needs to be done to the structure, you can afford to. Mm -hmm. um, okay. If you can, then yes, I would definitely recommend to go for a small building. Individual units are great from a safe and stable kind of perspective. It's... it's um, I mean, the, the monthly fees that you pay for building management and for the reserve funds sort of give you a bit of peace of mind that, you know, you're limited to only interior repairs and renovations if and when that's required, like between tenants, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm, uh, but mm -hmm. if, you can, if you can afford to and you can afford the reserves to put aside for it, um, there's just more that you can do when you own the bigger land parcel and you're not reliant on owner units, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so in that case, uh, would you recommend looking at the Fukuoka market rather than the local market here? I would say so because 60, 60 to 80 million will definitely buy you a nice, well-located, newish, well, not, not new, but newish building in Fukuoka. Mm -hmm. um, what, what does 60 million get in Fukuoka these days? Um, I'm just thinking about the last purchase we did. So for less than 50 million, we're talking, I think, 43 or 45 mil. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a fairly suburban but central property. So like um, mm -hmm. if you know Hakata Station. Yeah. Uh, so the south and east side of Hakata Ku is like the more mm -hmm. residential side. It's not the CB mm -hmm. per se. Mm -hmm. So we got a mm -hmm. recently got a property there that's eight units for about 45 million. Mm -hmm. I think from memory, that one is actually, I can look at it right now. Just give me a second. I think it was 12 year oldish. Oh, really? From memory, are those yeah. like one K units or one DK? One R or one K usually, yeah. One R, one K. Uh -huh. Yeah, and those are, I mean, they're easiest to find tenants for. Yeah, so that's like thirty-five thousand a month a door. Is is that would be in Kumoto? That'd be about thirty thirty-five thousand. I'm, I'm just looking for... at it now. So that was built a little bit older. That was built two thousand and four. Mm -hmm. 
the price was 40 million, eight units in the mm -hmm. building. Um, uh, the structure size is 150 and the units are all uh, 1K, yes. And mm -hmm. then another one that's a little bit more suburban, but in better shape. Give me a second. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so built 2012, just 10 years, or at the time of purchase, it was nine years, six units. Uh, and there are uh, mm -hmm. four of them are one LDK, two of them are two LDK. So two of them are actually oh, okay. kind of couple sized. Mm -hmm. um, and that was 55 million. And that generates an annual income, gross annual income of 360,000, Sandro Dokuman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the yield is about. Uh, between five to six percent before tax is the yield on both okay. of those. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that's what you can get in a little bit suburban Fukuoka. If you go a mm -hmm. little bit above 60 million, you could get about a lot more central, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yield might be a little bit lower, but you'll never be, uh, you'll never be uh, wanting for tenants, which is a great thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, it sounds like Generally, the prices are probably a bit higher than they are here in Kumoto, but yeah, that's the, the trade-off of cash flow versus whether the land the property is on are going to appreciate, right? And, and the uh, far younger, long-term stability, far younger mm -hmm. and more white-collar type of tenants than you'd get in Kumamoto. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, what kind of land would that property be on? Like fifty or sixty tsubo or something um, like that. I never quite know the Tsubo uh, conversion, uh, but one of them is on 150 square meter of land. The other one is on a 211 mm -hmm. square meter of land. Okay, yeah, so that's like 50 or 60 then. Yeah, okay. much much bigger than uh, much bigger than what you'd get in Tokyo and Osaka, for example. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, interesting. <laughs> um. What and, kind and, of and the advantage with Fukuoka is that you do have, if and when Japan's economy does well, Fukuoka always does well. So you do have potential for growth. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, if anywhere is going to do well, it's going to be Fukuoka. Eh? Yeah, Tokyo, Osaka, Fukuoka usually are the ones that uh, spring the highest when things go well. Yeah. Okay. Um, what do your customers usually do for financing? Are people working with mega banks or? If they're residing in Japan, they usually go for mega banks. If they're residing out of Japan, they just buy cash, to be honest. Um, there mm -hmm. are some mm -hmm. solutions for non-residents, but they're not very attractive. But it sounds like you've got a fantastic deal going there with the bank. So I would, whatever you've been doing with them, keep doing it. The, that's very rare even for residents. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I'd probably stay with my, my current banker. Um, but will they but lend for a um, well, you know, Kumoto Bank is under the Fukuoka, Fukuoka Bank purchased Kumoto Bank yeah. five or six years ago. So actually, they have to run everything up to Fukuoka Bank before they approve any of the loans. So I don't think it's it be an issue. Yeah. 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 Um, interesting. Do uh, in this kind of like 60 to 80 million range, do people usually wrap? The properties in in like a Godo Gaisha or something like that, or are most people purchasing it under their own names, or if you've how does got that usually the, work? If you've got the one, it's probably kind of borderline because if you look at the, um, let me just have a look. But you're saying you've already got a company, right? Yeah, I've got uh, two companies. Um, so one of them I've just kind of got sitting doing nothing. So uh, I could just buy the property with that company and have it be kind of like a, a standalone um, shell, not shell, but a uh, special purpose company for the property. Well, look, normally we tell people that it's not worth it setting up a company and starting to pay annual upkeep costs on a company if you're not going to yeah, be yeah. generating at least four or five million yen uh, in gross every year. Mm -hmm. And those two properties that we've just spoken about are generating less than that. So between two to three million mm -hmm. and net, net pre-tax every year. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you already got the structure and you're already paying upkeep costs on an existing structure or two, then I see no reason not to put it under them. Yeah, um, the, because I'm worried, you know, when I, when I leave the country 
does that mean I need to keep filing Japanese taxes or you do yes do I have to I I would have to keep filing personal Japanese taxes if I owned the property personally right yes and if you've got the company mm -hmm. still set up you'll also be needing to file uh, I mean uh, let's put it this way you're probably not going to be closing the companies when you leave yeah that's right mm -hmm. so you will definitely be filing corporate tax returns every year in any case so might as well yeah yeah under one of them and that gives you when you purchase mm -hmm. a property that also gives you a five year of uh, cost deductions as opposed to three years as an individual Mm -hmm. You can carry your purchase costs forward for five years. And there's just a lot more that you can claim. Your accountant can probably advise you on that, but there are a lot more options for deduction claims under a company structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you're only setting up the company for that purpose, then you need to factor in three to 4,000 bucks a year in, in you know, accounting and bookkeeping and corporate tax minimums. Mm -hmm, and so you mm -hmm. need to make sure those deductions actually build up to that level. But if you've already got the company uh, in place, then I, I'd say it's a no-brainer. I'd put it under the company. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so then I guess uh, what's what's the best way to go about it? If I want you to introduce some Fukuoka property to me, um, what, what should I do first? Should I go in and sell? Uh, the properties I do have and convert them to cash or, uh, well, this, you know, this, the, I guess uh, chicken and egg kind of thing. So I can, first off, it sounds like you're comfortable working directly with Japanese real estate professionals. So I'm wondering, not, not that we don't want your money, but I'm wondering if you mm -hmm. really need, do you really need us as the middleman or can you work maybe directly with the agents that I can introduce you to, and then we can provide consultation sort of thing. Which will be a lot cheaper. Yeah, I, I I could work directly with agents. Um, I just don't you know prefer, any agents in Fukuoka. Yeah, I, so. I can put you in touch with agents. That's not an issue. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. we, I mean, we can come in either as full facilitators or as consultants. The consulting group mm -hmm. is cheaper, but then we only communicate with you, and we, mm -hmm. we, can, mm -hmm. we can tell you our opinion on properties and what you need to make sure that you get and what to ask for, the right kind of questions to ask, and that kind of thing. Um, or mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. can facilitate the entire purchase. Um, like if you start communicating with an agent and it looks like the agent is not comfortable with you being overseas, then you can hire us as your proxy and we'll do the full facilitation. So we interrupt this broadcast. I always wanted to say this. We interrupt this broadcast to tell you about Tokyo Family Stays. They're a short term rentals company in Tokyo and they offer a home away from home experience, which is just perfect for remote working, quarantining, or if you just need summer quiet to hide away from the world. So they offer a variety of options for families, for corporate relocations, or simply if you're transitioning between homes in Tokyo. Now, the properties are super comfortable, tastefully furnished, fully equipped with all amenities, and they accommodate up to 10 people. So really, the only thing you'll need to bring with you is your toothbrush and maybe a change of clothes. They've got fast, unlimited wireless internet, dedicated workspaces, and fully equipped kitchens, and they're just a delight to stay in, a fantastic alternative to Japanese business hotels, which if you've ever stayed in one, you probably know they're tiny, they're noisy, fine for a night or two if you're on your own, but long-term or with a family, you'll probably feel you're in a jail cell very quickly. So if you wanna give yourself a sense of space and freedom by renting a real home with comfortable Western beds, including all the necessities like baby bedding, children's toys, high chairs, you definitely wanna reach out to Tokyo Family Stays. They've been at it for over a decade. They're a fully licensed minpaku or short-term stay operator. And as a special bonus for our viewers and listeners, they're also throwing in a breakfast basket upon arrival for anyone who books and mentions the Japan Real Estate Podcast or NTI. And not only for guests, if you're a property owner, you've got an investment property that you want to tweak for higher profits or a holiday home that you want rented out when not in use via short-term stays, drop them a line today, see how they can help you maximize your property's income. And again, as a special bonus to our viewers and listeners, they're also offering a free audit of your existing short-term stay listings without any obligation whatsoever. So feel free to reach out to them at tokyofamilystays.com. Well worth your visit. And again, if you're in the market for a family home in or around the Tokyo metropolitan area, Emil's your man. Don't be shy to reach out to him as well at emil.gorgies, G-O-R-G-E-E-S at tokyorealty.jp. I see. Mm -hmm. right. You can start. You can start one way and then switch to the other way. So with hiring us, that that's pretty flexible. 
with whether you should sell first or not, it really depends because the, the market moves very quickly, as you probably know, mm-hmm. in Kumamoto and probably even quicker than that in Fukuoka. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're putting in an application because you want to start the due diligence process, you want to start getting documentation for review and all of that, and you should be ready to settle within maximum two months from application. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not sure where you stand with your bank. Will they will they forward the uh, funds in advance on the basis of you selling the properties down the track, or will they have will they need to have everything ready? Uh, that's not actually a, a discussion we've had yet. Um, the last time, so I was looking at a property in the like thirty to. 35 million range here locally um, that I was just going to uh, buy with not so much money down and not sell any of the properties. Um, but the, the property came on the market. I took it to the bank the next day. Uh, the banker drove out there to look at it to start the their uh, assessment. What is it? Assessment. And their assessment came back a week later. I called up uh, my real estate agent. He's like, oh, sorry, it's sold. Yeah, similar story here. That's going to be the case. Damn it. It's only been a week. (laughs) The thing is, look, whenever you're applying to purchase a property and at least part of the financing is coming from a bank loan, Mm -hmm. um, the seller would obviously always prefer to sell to somebody who's not dependent on bank approval. Yeah, of course. So if Mm -hmm. if a cash offer comes in, they're not going to give you the time of day. So if you want to be sure to get your hands on a good property fast, then yes, I would sell those first. Mm-hmm, uh, but, you, mm-hmm. but you're saying that in any case, at least part of the funds will come via loan, right? Yeah. Um, you know, if I'm selling what I have now and buying something else for a similar price, that just seems like a waste of money because I lose a lot of money in the transactions. So yeah. if I do sell what I have now, it'll be to use that as part of a down payment for a, a larger portfolio or and does your a bank larger do, uh, does building. Does Komoto Bank do pre-approvals? Uh, no. 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 Yeah, so that, they, it doesn't really they matter. They can tell me. Yeah, they, they tell me, you know, like. Once they uh, review the property. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they, they give me advice, like, uh, based on your your company's whatever recently, uh, we probably have this amount of money um, that we can loan to you. Um, but the, the exact details on the loan like for example what percent needs to be down or how many years the loan's going to be for what the interest rate are going to be is after the assessment well I, i'm more concerned with them um, whether they'll approve a loan for this particular property or not so how fast can they tell you yes or no on that because i mean the terms of the loan whatever terms they give you will probably be attractive enough japan being japan and interest rates being so yeah. low um, I'm more concerned if, if it's going to be, like you said, like it, it's going to take them a week to, and they need to drive up and have a personal look at the property and so forth. And you're just going to miss out on a lot of them. Yeah. Um, so the, the guy said if the property is newer than 15 years, then it's probably in whatever bank assessment software they have. So yeah. they don't have to look at it or do anything. They just bring it up on their, their software system and it automatically assesses it. Okay. Based on whatever, you know, parameters they put in for the customer. Yep. But if it's older than, I, I can't remember exactly, it's older than 15 or 17 years or something, it's not covered in that system. So they have to actually go out and, and take pictures and stuff. Well, because these are wooden structures, I would, we would, as a company, personally, normally advise to go for 20 years at most. <laughs> so we can definitely aim for 15 years properties if that makes it e- easier for the bank to quickly come back to you and say yes we'll loan for that we'll lend for that <laughs> um what's your general uh impression of for example nice buildings in good locations in kind of like third tier markets so i'm thinking like uh if it were Fukuoka, like right in front of Yanagawa Station or right in front of, uh, shoot, Okawa Station or something like that. Um, how, how do you feel about those kind of properties generally? Um, they work. They definitely work, but we're kind of losing the potential growth aspect, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's the okay. only thing. So there are a couple of particular stations, I'd say Befu Station and uh, the one right after Takamiya, I always forget the name of that station, that we feel mm-hmm. 
are probably good candidates for the next uh, for the next station down the line that's going to be gaining in value. Um, mm -hmm. So I probably, if we want to capitalize on potential growth, if and when it happens, I probably stick to those stations or closer to center. Um, mm -hmm. But if you're looking for the maximum cash flow that you can get and you're not concerned about potential growth, then yes, all of those would work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Um, do you have any uh, particular general thoughts about wood versus uh, tech king versus tech kotze? Um I'd love to see a reinforced concrete building in your budget, but they're pretty rare. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, wood or steel? What, what, is, what is kind of the range for RC in Fukuoka? Um, they'd start at about 80 million. They'd need to be uh -huh, probably... Uh -huh. Three floors, three floors, if we're lucky, usually four floors and higher is where we'd start seeing more concrete. Mm -hmm. um, depending on location, we might be able to get something like that, but it's not, it's going to be older though. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It's not going to be, definitely not going to be 20 years or younger. With reinforced concrete, we don't mind if it's thir up to 30 years, maybe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, the price is going to be a bit out of the range, eh? Uh, maybe, maybe if they're very suburban, we can, we can swing something. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. We can look, we can look and see what's available at the market at any given time. So if you end up getting us for full facilitation, so we're going to do is, you know, unlimited amount of research, uh, as part of mm -hmm. that process. And if you get mm -hmm. us on a consultation basis, which is an hourly basis, then we can put in two or three hours for research out of your mm -hmm. hourly mm -hmm. bank and just see what comes up and in which areas at what prices and so forth. Okay. Um, can you tell me a bit about your fee structure and, and how those kind of things work? Yeah. So the hourly retainer is uh, charged by 10 hours at a time. Mm -hmm. Those are uh, 2,800 yen per hour or including taxes, just over 3,000 yen per hour. Mm -hmm. And the full facilitation is uh, unlimited work until settlement. And that mm -hmm. depends on the property price. So for the range that you're talking about, it's 3% plus tax. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And that's, I see. that's payable in advance uh, based on your estimated budget. And then we credit or debit after settlement as per the actual purchase price. Okay, I see. So mm, similar to uh, a realtor's. Uh, yes, except it comes uh, on top of the real fee. Okay, yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. But um, I think <laughs> from our experience, I mean, you sound like you're pretty experienced too, but what I usually tell um, customers who haven't done this much in Japan is that we just in saving you costly mistakes and giving you negotiation options that you might not have been aware of, we usually more than cover ourselves. Yeah, of course. Uh -huh. um, do you guys do anything? Um, I'm guessing... Oh, damn. I can't speak English anymore. <laughs> um, Short-term rentals, do you do, you do any kind of... Yeah, I mean, Paku, I mean, Paku uh, uh, advising or management, work, those kind of things. We work with monthly monthly rentals companies. And mm -hmm. we, we can work with Min Paku companies if that's what you want. But that's definitely mm -hmm. not something I'd look into before Corona blows over. Oh, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Mm. Uh, monthly rentals is more like for company staff who are being sent around for like short-term assignment it kind of thing. It can be or? that, or it can be people on uh, extended holidays, like going to take care of elderly parents. It can be people mm -hmm. that are attending like uh, freelancers who are doing a project in a particular city. It can be uh, people mm -hmm. on, uh, for some reason, once the tourists come back, it's going to be people, people who come here for a year to study karate or, or shoji or whatever, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's mm -hmm. a good market for it, but that market is severely uh, oppressed by uh, Corona at the moment. Yeah, so that would be similar to Minpaku, and that'd be fully furnished and and managed kind of thing. Or yes, the difference is that um, it's not. I mean, Minpaku can be very profitable if it's in a very good location and it, the, the occupancy rates are very high. But Minpaku mm -hmm. comes with its whole set of legislations and uh, bylaws and hoops to jump through um, uh, from. Mm -hmm. a, from an official perspective, whereas monthly rentals are just normal leases. They're done with the lease in place, but you just charge higher for it because it's by the month. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then 
your side is the the cleaning fees and all that. Um, yeah, so the it's property, not like a normal rental where. Yeah, so the property yeah. management companies that do that um, have been doing it on a regular basis, and they know what to charge for uh, check-ins, checkouts, cleaning, security deposits, internet fees, mm-hmm. and so forth, uh, utilities mm-hmm. fees. And they'll advise, depending on what's happening in the market, if you need to reduce your uh, daily fee or increase your daily fee, um, they know their stuff. So depending on what you want to do with the property, we would be putting a normal long-term lease property manager or monthly property manager or mean Paco property manager in place, um, depending mm-hmm. on what you mm-hmm. want to do with the property. Mm-hmm. Okay. With mean Paco, there's also the um, local municipality regulations to consider. So some city wards only allow it on the weekend. Some city wards only allow it uh, within a certain distance from a school and so forth. So There'd be a bit of looking okay. into mm-hmm. that before we can uh, switch over to Ming Paku. With monthly leases, mm-hmm. nobody's got any say. If you own the structure, it's your decision. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but if you if you want to consider potential short term rentals, whether monthly or not, and um, you want to get a lot closer to center, the suburban ones will not do for that. Mm-hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Mm. Okay. Um, um, if, say, for example, I do uh, want to move out of the Kumoto area, um, is there any benefit to, you know, Tokyo or Osaka versus Fukuoka, or is it similar in terms of returns these days? It's not similar in terms of... <laughs> Fukuoka is, uh, can generate much higher returns than Tokyo or Osaka. Mm-hmm. And if you are thinking about those areas, I'd maybe go for uh, Kobe or Yokohama mm-hmm. uh, or maybe Chiba City. Uh, we've got a lot of customers who are making um, nicer profits over there that are more similar to Fukuoka. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Advantage-wise, I, I mean, look, Fukuoka, I feel that's just a personal opinion, but I feel that Fukuoka does have more room to grow as opposed to Tokyo and Osaka because they're very close to where they were pre-1990 bubble. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, before the bubble burst, I mean. Um, but Kobe, Yokohama are similar. With Yokohama specifically, you want to, I mean, the city is Japan's second biggest city, but it's really only the area next to the port that's mm-hmm. really urban. The rest of it is very, very suburban. I'd say almost rural. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, Chiba City, Kobe City, uh, Kyoto, if we can get something, it gets pretty expensive towards the center of the city, but suburban Kyoto is maybe still affordable. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, Kawasaki, if we can swing it, it's pretty close to Tokyo prices, but we might be able to get something a little bit cheaper and higher yield there. Mm-hmm. Um, and otherwise, yeah, Fukuoka is always, I mean, a lot of our customers love Kumamoto as well because the cash flow is much higher than any, any of these other places that I've mentioned now. Yeah, cash flow is, uh, is good here. If, yeah, uh, but the population you're is not older. worried about. Yeah, population yes. is older and capital growth mm-hmm. is non existent. Yes. And uh, a lot of, you know, when, when I look around at uh, these wooden structures, uh, I'm always nervous. Um, <laughs> how much do I really know about the damage that happened in the 2016 earthquake? True. Um, there's, there's always some part you just can't see. That's um, another so, advantage, I think, of Fukuoka is that of all those places that we've mentioned, it's probably the least uh, risk for uh, earthquakes or at least mm-hmm. has yeah. been so far. With Kumamoto 2, um, population was going up until 2015, but I've just looked at the numbers for 15 to 2020, which were released uh, a few months ago. Uh, mm-hmm. you're, you're not gaining in population over there anymore. Yeah, yeah um, it's really, um, there's a few suburban areas, like around all the semiconductor manufacturers um, that are supposedly doing well population-wise, kind yeah. of have, you know, a lot of... Uh, engineers and professionals buying but mostly houses right so um not really what i'm looking to do um there's not a lot of like single young guys renting apartments there it's everybody with their house and their two cars so yeah the 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 prices are going up there but it's not like a good investment market i don't think yeah so all of the other cities that we've just spoken about are all gaining in population whether it's organically Mm -hmm. Fukuoka, or just because people are migrating into the city like other places. But Tokyo, actually, for the first time in a long time, is losing population because of the... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
But uh, so basically, it sounds like you think Fukuoka is the good balance between the, the future kind of growth in property prices and the ability to generate cash flow. I would say so. If you're looking for a uh, mm -hmm. kind of um, city profile upgrade from Kumamoto, um, mm -hmm. I think Fukuoka or maybe central Yokohama would be where you'd find um, kind of the balance between Kumamoto and the bigger metropolitan centers. The only other alternative would be maybe Sapporo, but winters can be pretty rough on vacancies and maintenance there. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, I actually have a friend who bought property in Yokohama recently. I should talk to him. I didn't even think about it. Mm. Yeah, okay. Yokohama's not bad. Chiba, Chiba City is not bad, and Kobe is not bad as well. And mm -hmm. Nagoya, is, mm -hmm. Nagoya is pretty good, but the population there is a bit more rough around the edges, more blue-collar. Uh, mm -hmm. You'd get, I mean, it's still Japan. It's not like you're going to have a drug lab in the apartment, but if you get payment <laughs> issues or tenant who you know are late or missing on payments we tend to have a bit more of that in nagoya than in other cities well yeah evidently the the yakuza are a huge issue down here in komodo you know um so that's that's a thing i hear a lot of you know sometimes there's a you didn't know but now there's a yakuza living in your building and there's no way to get we've them out, had basically. that in fukuoka a couple of times too actually <laughs> yeah i'm guessing takyushu probably has a Kitakyushu, or Kitakyushu, we, we bought a few apartments there when we started, never again. <laughs> Kitakyushu is a nightmare. <laughs> but no, even in Fukuoka, but to be honest with you, it affects your resale prices. If there's a Yakuza office in the building or what, everybody yeah, knows yeah. about it and it's going to be difficult to sell the property, but we've never had problem finding tenants for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. Okay. Mm. Cool. Okay. Um, is, is there anything else I should be asking or uh, anything you want to know or um no you painted a pretty full picture i guess once we start looking at actual locations and properties we'll probably be exchanging a bit more q a uh, mm -hmm. but otherwise to just to get going i think we we know enough yeah okay um then i'll uh sit down with my banker in the next couple of days and, and just check about you know uh can i purchase in fukuoka um do i need to make like a and a, a bank account at the Fukuoka Bank version, or you know, yeah, just check that there there aren't any. And, and also there. ask him if they can uh, if they can uh, forward funds while you're working to sell the properties, or if they need it all mm -hmm. settled in advance. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's good. I almost forgot about that. So uh, that that's a common thing. Then you know, if I make a commitment, I'm going to sell all these properties. Um, they will forward the funds even while the, the sales are pending or I know while they, they, still putting them on market? They definitely do that with home loans. Like if you've got a <laughs> home loan and you're saying that you want to upgrade the house and you're rolling over, so they're aware of the fact that you don't want to you know, move out and start renting. So <laughs> they will let you buy the new house and give you like six or eight months to, but, but they will keep badgering you. Have you sold it? Have you sold it? Have you sold it? Uh, okay. Whether they do that with investment properties or not, I'm not sure. But your banker sounds like a pretty uh, progressive dude, so maybe. <laughs> well, uh, mm, yes, Komodo Bank is uh, way behind uh, Higo Bank in terms of like regional banking. So they're they've got a bit of a catching up <laughs> uh, reputation for uh, being really cooperative. You know. Yeah. So um. But if you could introduce me, I'm assuming the banker only speaks Japanese, right? Uh, I don't know, but I'm assuming as well. I've never yep. had a chance to speak to him in English, so. Well, if you could ask him if it's okay for us to contact him, and I'll make sure it's a Japanese side of our company who contacts him. He doesn't need to be scary of foreigners. Um, mm -hmm. It would be really good to uh, for my partner, for Chikako, to maybe have a chat with him about uh, how we can cooperate to get him some more clients and help our clients get some more loans. Yeah, if, if you guys are doing work in, in Komoto, I'm sure they'd be uh, yep. excited to talk to Komoto you Komoto and Fukuoka are both very active markets for us. Okay, cool. Awesome. Well, great meeting you. Yeah, thank you very much for your time. You too. Speak to you soon. Yeah, have a nice day. You too. Bye-bye. Okay, so again, very interesting conversation, I thought. Not your typical first-time investor, but actually someone who's already invested in Japan, already taken out investment loans here as well. Bit of a higher-end discussion. Hope you have found some value in it. 
Now, before we go, we're also, as always, going to tell you and also link to our other sponsor's website. That's Hiroshi Shimizu, immigration lawyer and administrative scrivener. If you're thinking about moving here on a more permanent basis, or you're already in Japan on some sort of a temporary visa, and you want to switch to a longer term or permanent one, or if you're considering setting up a local company or a branch office of a foreign company, and you've got any sort of business or visa related inquiries, or even if you just want to find out what your options are on any of these topics, feel free to contact Hiroshi Shimizu. You can find him at japanimmigrationexperts.com and he can help you set up a company, apply for any kind of visa, or just provide you with the best advice and extremely affordable consultation related to these topics. And he's already done that for many of our listeners. So feel free to reach out to him. Again, that's japanimmigrationexperts.com and you'll be well on your way. And that's it from us for today, folks. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Japan Real Estate Podcast. Do share it with your networks and please let us know what you think. So leave us a short rating or review on the iTunes store, on Spotify, or just drop us a line in the comment section or wherever you might have found this episode. We love hearing from you. Hope to have you with us again next time. And until then, have a great day or night ahead. Yoroshiku. Yoroshiku.